And we're back in Nina again. And this time I just want to show what I typically do when I start a session, like besides a polar line with sharp cap, for example, and setting up my sequence, which uh, we're looking at, at a, in, a, in a different video. Uh, to do that, I'll typically be using the imaging uh, tab. Uh, sometimes I like double check what I have in the, the equipment as well to make sure that uh, everything's good, nothing's messed up, um, and everything is connected as it should be. Uh, of course, I, uh, well, typically what I'll do is if I have a target in mind for the evening, uh, rather than use the sequencer to, uh, to get to it at first, so the first target I'll have will not have slew to target, I'll just manually do it. So the first thing I'll do is I'll go to the imaging tab, which should have that uh, kind of interface here. And you can see there are tools and informational windows at the top. Anything that's kind of highlighted is available somewhere in here. So we have like uh, here the, uh, the image, it's here. We have uh, the camera information which is indeed here with the target uh, temperature is minus 10. You can see I could even start the warming or cooling of the camera from here. So I could say, hey, actually I want minus five. Click here, the target temp is now minus five and we should see this uh, change over time. Uh, the filter wheel is also here. You can see it, I have it here. And you can actually click and drag and drop, but I prefer not to do it because I like the layout as it is and it's easy to get kind of confused. Um, so I just enable and disable what I don't need. For example, rotator is something I don't need. So I just disable it and you can see the tab that was there has disappeared. Telescope, I have it here um, anyway. Uh, so it's, uh, it's there. I have a guider tab, which is here where I can look at my guide graph without having to go to uh, PhD2. Uh, of course, PhD2 works wonderfully, but on slower computers, it's nice not to have to switch between uh, applications. I have uh, the weather uh, information here. Uh, this is from the, uh, the Open Weather uh, API. Uh, and here it is. My temperature, uh, which kind of disagrees a little bit with my focuser, but uh, yeah, 2986 uh, versus, what is it saying? 20.06, uh, we're in the same range. Humidity, uh, the dew point is uh, fairly high, so you know you need to be careful. And sunrise, sunset. So this is a pretty neat tool to have as well. Uh, you have uh, the sequence information, which is uh, here, the active sequence. Uh, you have a switch, which is you know a feature that's been implemented recently in here. I haven't used it, so I'm not going to comment on it. You have statistics about the image that are available here. Um, plus the histogram, uh, quite important. And you have the HR HFR history that basically whenever your sequence is running, you'll start to see a chart with the number of stars uh, detected in each frame and the uh, HFR, uh, so measure of how tight the stars are uh, computed as well as a chart. This will only uh, be in there if you have like the star icon set up there. Um, and then you have like the, the image history uh, that can happen, uh, that will appear here with the uh, HFR for each image and you'll be able to click on an image to see it here. It's all uh, quite powerful. Um, you have uh, the image uh, tab itself. Uh, you can you know uh, get into uh, the zoom, uh, idle size, 100%, uh, 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 zoom in, zoom out with the scr scroll wheel. Uh, you can also like plate solve the current image. I typically don't use that, but it's possible. You can have a crosshair as well. Uh, something that's really neat is an aberration inspector. If you have a star field and you want to see how your corner stars are looking, that's really neat to see. Uh, so I use it when I have my uh, F2 uh, 135mm lens because any um, uh, how do you say that? angle mismatch between uh, the uh, sensor uh, and the lens can cause uh, aberrations there. Uh, and then you have the auto stretch. I highly recommend turning that on. Uh, so it's basically doing what the STF in PixInsight Pix would do. And there's the star detection and the um, H, uh, HFR um, analysis uh, as well in here. That's necessary to be enabled for the image history to work well. 
And then we have a bad enough uh, analyzer that uh, is supposed to help with bad enough mask focusing. I have never used it, so I'm not going to comment on it. And you have uh, the ability to set a subsample, uh, which you can then use here by doing enable subsampling. This is not really something I've used, although uh, I've uh, recently uh, added a way to do to use only a center part of the uh, image for autofocus. It's not in this uh, nightly version yet. Hopefully, it will be in the next one. Um, then we have like the tools at the top right, some of the very important tools and let me click on the image first uh, that we really that I really like to have is uh, plate solving, it's already there. Uh, polar alignment, I have not used it. Uh, I'm not sure how it works, so I'm not going to comment on it. But I like to have autofocus here, so I can actually run an autofocus uh, round here. And uh, the manual focus targets can be really nice and that's usually what I start with. So I'll go into manual focus targets and then for the current time, like if there are stars, it gi it's going to give uh, the the most br the brightest stars in the sky with the altitude as well. So you can choose skies that are nice high up or close to your target, depending on what you need. And then slew to target and the, uh, the telescope will slew uh, to the best of its ability uh, to, uh, to, that, uh, to that star. And once it's done, uh, you can actually, you know, uh, use this imaging tab here with a specific exposure time, a specific filter, specific binning, and take an exposure. Here it's cloudy today, so we're not seeing anything. Uh, but even if you don't see uh, Vega here, what I usually do then, and you know, my, my mount can get uh, misaligned very easily, is I'll just go to plate solving after slowing. Uh, Nina remembers where it's supposed to be pointing, so I'll just say sync, reslew to target. Maybe if I'm feeling uh, uh, adventurous, I'll just repeat until I'm less than one arc minute from the target, and I'll just click uh, play here. And this will actually launch a plate solving, um, a plate solving round, and uh, it's uh, it's basically going to center Vega, and then I can use a bad enough mask to do a rough focus, after which I'll launch one round of autofocus with my autofocus filter to make sure that autofocus is working fine. And if it's not working fine, I might go in the options, change the autofocus exposure time for my filter, maybe change uh, the um, also the, uh, what's something I mentioned in one of the other videos, the auto stretch factor here. Um, maybe I'll have annotate image set to on so that it can display the stars that autofocus selected. Um, uh, in this version, they're not going to be actually uh, visible, but in the next one, with it's going to be they're they're going to be visible with autofocus as well to see uh, why it's not detecting stars, right? And uh, and if I see that I have a nice autofocus curve uh, and a nice autofocus point at the end then I'm all good, I know that my sequence will work fine. And so that's um, that's how I prepare for my imaging. So typically, after I've done this uh, bad enough mask focus, I'll slew to my first target using the Sky Atlas. So up click slew and it goes there. And once it's on that first target, I'll, uh, I'll just go to uh, um, uh, to imaging and I'll, I'll do one round of autofocus and once it's ready I'll go to sequence uh, make sure that start guiding is on slew to target and center target is off on my first target because well I've already done it manually and uh, in the reverse I'll be ma I'll be making sure that it's on for my second third uh, fourth and, and fifth target as well right uh, I'll make sure that my autofocus uh, parameters are correct, that my exposure kind of parameters are correct, my dither is on, etc. And then I'll click play. And uh, when you start a sequence, uh, by the way, there's a pre-sequence checklist. So, for example, if I go back to imaging and the camera, or I go back to the uh, the camera and I turn the cooler off uh, because I just like you know I I forgot to cool my camera. Uh, the uh, Nina will remind me of that uh, so I can click play and you can see it tells me that camera has a cooler but it is not enabled Do you want to start the sequence anyway uh, actually I added this feature um, like a month ago after I went to a dark site 
at least from my standards, so Bortle bor 4 or so, uh, much better than here, which is a super wide zone, um, and uh, forgot to turn on the cooler, and I got really, a, a f I mean, it's, it's a bit of a waste of a very noisy kind of sequence when you could have uh, turned the cooler on. So it checks for a variety of things, like you have dither enabled, but your guide is not connected. Your s telescope is set to park at the end of the sequence, but it's not connected, blah, blah, blah. So you, you'll see any uh, any sort of things that can uh, happen. Also, yeah, before the sequence, one of the things I'll make sure is that when the sequence ends, my mount will park and my camera will warm. Um, so uh, that's pretty much uh, pretty much it, and uh, then my pictures will be uh, automatically in the Nina folder, and then it's uh, down for processing. And so that's uh, that's how I uh, run with my imaging uh, runs with uh, Nina. I hope this was uh, a, a useful video. Thank you very much.